right. Well, good evening, everybody out in living history land. This is Will from Two Boar Historic Events. I've got Andrew Hufftailing and Stephen Pavey from the events also with me. And tonight we're going to talk uh, about the upcoming event in August of 2021, Denoiner, representing uh, three companies of the 9th Ohio in a immersive living history at the Carnifax Ferry Battlefield working on actual ground. And tonight we're going to talk about the uniforms we've been working back and forth. Andrew, uh, who you see in the check shirt, is a uh, member of Denoiner uh, unit out of Ohio who does represent these men. We've been working with him and numbers of other people as THE to make sure we do the uniforms just as best as we can without saying, hey, go buy a whole new uniform. So trying to work a good evening, Andrew. Good evening, Will. How you doing? I'm good. Good evening, Stephen. How are you? Hey, Will. Doing great. Good. Well, we've got a couple six people here. Hey, gang, we can see comments here. I know there's a couple of seconds of a delay, but go ahead and check in on the comments. Let us know who's here. Look forward to chatting a little bit. Uh, I've got my slate over here. Uh, we're live on the Tubor Historic Events page, but we've also got a uh, we've also got a group uh, event for the Denoiner Living History, August 6th through 8th, 2021. In there, Stephen posted the uniform guidelines. They've also been shared out by both Stephen and Eric Tipton of the Authentic Campaigner for um, uh, to share them out around the historic community. I see Eric Smallwood jumping in. Good evening, Eric. Glad to have you here as a both Ohio and West Virginia fella. Uh, Stephen, let me start with you and let you just step in where you'd like to start talking about the uniform. Obviously, everybody can read what we've written, but hit the highlights and let us know what's going on. All right, well, uh, thanks. Um, so early Ohio is uh, pretty interesting. And I do want to thank Eric Smallwood for spending quite a bit of time with me uh, talking about some of the early contracts, um, kind of some of the changes that were made to the early regulations between 1857 and finally in 1861. Um, he's been instrumental in a lot of this research. So thank you. Um, and so kind of to give an idea, um, in 1857 regulations, the, Ohio, the state of Ohio asked for um, a frock coats with sky blue trousers. And we should, be, and we, I was gonna say, we should be clear, these are state regulations, not federal regulations, right? That's the Ohio state regulations. That's correct. Um, so the state initially requires um, sky blue trousers. This changes in 1861. Um, whenever the uh, call for volunteers uh, takes place in April of 61. And some of the changes that take place um, are uh, they create both a parade uniform as well as a fatigue uniform. And some of the differences that they had were that the parade uniform would consist of a kepi um, with a frock coat and then dark blue trousers. Um, and then the fatigue uniform would consist of the Ohio uh, black hat, essentially, with a blouse and then gray trousers with a black stripe. Um, the 9th Ohio was actually issued both of these uniforms uh, between May 27th, 1861, and then I think it was June 4th of 1861. Um, so there's been a lot of you know, questions about, you know, what parts from both uniforms, you know, if guys kind of made their own choices about what, what they take. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of, um, you know, any general orders that I've been able to find that specify that the 9th Ohio was only taking their entire fatigue uniform versus taking their entire dress uniform. Um, various newspaper articles mention both uniforms being worn at different times by the 9th Ohio. Um, so, so it really has been uh, a fascinating story to kind of uh, kind of research into and learn about. Um, and I'm excited to see this in the field at Carnifex next August. Cool. Well, as far as excitement, I can't think anybody more excited than somebody who represents this unit get to see his home re unit represented at a campaigner level living history. Andrew, why don't you jump in with anything you've got as far as there you want to share here? Sure. Well, um, there is an article in the Cincinnati Volksbund, which is a German language newspaper, one of several uh, in Cincinnati, um, from May 29th, 1861. And... Uh, uh, what they say is the day before yesterday, so that's May 27th, in camp they began to distribute uniforms for the German regiment, and yesterday the distribution was completed. The uniform consists of a fatigue and a parade dress. 
The former is a long blue jacket that hangs loose on the body, but by no means hinders the use of arms. The trousers are of a gray cloth with black stripes. Uh, the parade dress is a blue tunic. They use the word Waffenrock. Uh, with polished buttons cut from light cloth and made very handsomely. Mounted on the shoulder are brass epaulets, which are in fact not very pretty, uh, but are supposed to be useful, as old soldiers assure us. And well, that's from May 29th. Well, let me ask you something. You said a German word there, uh, Wattenrock, I believe, is a pretty close, isn't it? Yeah, a uh, Wappenrock, and it's uh, it describes a, uh, a sort of a longer, um, what we would call a frock coat. Okay, cool. This is just something as we go, as we continue to learn, as we get ready to portray De Neuner, one of the things we're going to be talking about is, without becoming perfectly conversational and fluent in German, which my two years in college really didn't do for me, still pick up a lot of things. Just like in my first century Roman living history, we're going to go, I am learning Latin out of the first century. We're going to get a chance to learn a lot of these terms. And so I wanted to have you say that one more time for us, please. Waffenrock. It's oh. W-A-F-F-E-N-R-O-C-K. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Yes. Go ahead, Well, I'd like to say one thing real quick. Um, to, to, to it, May 27th, uh, where it talks about, you know, this article appears on uh, May 29th, which is very important. Um, so the date, whenever Andrew says the day before yesterday, being May 27th, uh, the 9th Ohio initially issued as a three-month unit. And on May 27th, they actually mustered in for three years. So essentially what happens at Camp Denison is these guys, they muster in for three years and they're immediately issued both a fatigue and a dress uniform at Camp Denison. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting that they were able to move that quickly. And for guys who haven't seen one of my posts before, uh, the 9th Ohio was, was actually the first regiment from Ohio to muster in for three years. Um, so there's, it, it's, it's really just a, a great story uh, that I think guys over the next um, 12 months, 14 months, while we're kind of uh, preparing for this event, uh, that guys are really going to, there's just so much micro history that we can get into for these guys, uh, and they're going to have a great time. So Fantastic. Well, uh, let's let's say good evening to some of those guys. Bradley Finfrock, Andrew Pleva, Justin Mays, good Ohio man there. Shane Pinson, how are you? Elsie Gam, guten Abend. He says, guten Abend, Kameraden. So <laughs> glad to glad to have you with us. Um, and for those of you who don't speak any German at all, guten Abend. Rough translation is good evening. So glad to have you guys with us. Um, we're going to hear a name of another organization that doesn't have anything right now to do with living history that we're going to interact with and collide with over the next couple of months, and that's the GACL. Andrew, would you, uh, since we've got a chance this evening, would you make kindly make the introduction for us, please? Absolutely. Uh, the GACL is the German American Citizens League of Cincinnati. Um, and uh, what it is is an umbrella organization, uh, which th their uh, goal is to celebrate and educate about German American culture uh, here in the United States. And they partner uh, with um, several groups uh, across the country as well as over in Germany and other parts of Europe. So um, we have, uh, with that uh, organization, here in Cincinnati, there are about 25 or 30 active member organizations, and uh, the Ninth Ohio a Living History is a, uh, a member of that uh, organization. And so um, through uh, Living Histories, uh, educational demos, parades, and that sort of thing, you know, we, we try to raise awareness of specifically the, uh, the role of the German-American soldier during the Civil War. Um, and we do that through living history. And uh, so working with the GACL, it's it's sort of a uh, uh, partnership that hasn't been done yet. Um, and uh, both sides are, are really uh, enthusiastic and, and uh, um, we're, we're, we're excited to be uh, a part of this uh, this uh, event. Well, why don't you spring the surprise for the evening when fellas show up at the event? How's the GACL gonna say hello to us? Well, one of the uh, one of the things that we uh, that we found in the primary sources is that um, on uh, now I need to find the uh, the date um, on in August on August 11th, I believe it was. 
Uh, they received August 2nd, correct. Um, they received a shipment from uh, their settler, Frank Link, and uh, on that uh, was a load of uh, a shipment of ha- Havelocks. Um, and the quote here uh, says, the Havelocks arrived here by Mr. Hesburgh and were dis- distributed today. You see them worn in all possible ways until the best way is discovered. Sincere thanks to the donors who acted toward the 9th Regiment in this appropriate way. How much these gifts to us are appreciated may be shown by the following simple example. A rather quiet soldier pressed quietly as he received it, a kiss on his havelock, with the remark that it is meant for those women whose hands made and donated them. Uh, And so uh, the 9th Ohio Living History, along with the GACL, is going to uh, donate a uh, havelock to each of the uh, the participants in uh, this uh, r- this event. Very cool, very cool. Well, hey, let me. T- that's just. I mean, it's going to be interesting to learn this. Interesting to do that and see where that comes from. Uh, a couple of more. Go- uh, hello, uh, guten Abend uh, to uh, Javon Harrell. Guten Abend to Tim Fritz. Shane Penson asked, "Is it known how many German Americans served in the Union Army?" Uh, there are estimates. It goes anywhere from, uh, we, we know at least 160,000. Um, some estimates are much higher than, uh, than that, even up to uh, close to 250,000. Um, so you can say about 200,000 and be, uh, be fairly, uh, fairly safe. And it was the, uh, uh, the highest represented minority based on uh, population uh, per capita, uh, representation in in uh, the Union armies. Cool. Well, that's great, uh, gang. We're not going to go ahead and read these articles verbatim uh, or read these things. Go ahead and read the uniform. Uh, had somebody hit a angry post just a second ago. I hope that's nothing anybody can know about. So we'll check into that later on. Um, but the one thing we'd like to do here, Stephen, if you want to just quickly talk about the weaponry of the three companies, because we'll, we'll announce who company commanders are very shortly. We've got them picked out. That'll come up soon, and then that'll start to inform what's up. But for now, would you talk quickly about those uh, weapons, because those are a little bit different on a per-company basis. Uh, yeah, well, so the, um, the the 9th Ohio received kind of just a mixture of arms, Um we, we know that 1st and 3rd Company were actually issued 1855 Harper's Ferries, um, mm-hmm. and, uh, of course, with the Maynard system. And, uh, you know, obviously there are a limited number of 1855s in the hobby, um, so that's why we are allowing 1861 Springfields as a backup if you don't have the 55. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, just because that we don't have any records of infields being with any of the companies in the ninth Ohio, we're just, you know, we're trying to basically say, you know, bring a 55, a 61, mine's free to loan personally if somebody wants to borrow mine. Um, just, you know, 55s and 61s are what we're looking at. And it's actually pretty cool because um, there's a, a letter that appears in the Cincinnati Volkswagen on June 3rd. Um, that says that this morning the German regiment received a thousand rifle and four thousand musket cartridges for target practice. Um, it talked about how um, most of the regiment hadn't shot anything yet, but then it describes the Maynard system, which I thought was pretty cool, and says um, on the rifle there is a capsule between the hammer and the cone, which is a container for a band of caps rolled up in a spiral. That each time it is cocked pass through an opening under the hammer to strike when fired, you know, describing the use of that. Um, so again, for first and third companies, uh, 55s or 61s are what we're shooting for. The second company is a little bit different. Uh, they were issued 1842 Springfields. They were actually marked 1847s. Um, you know, obviously I, we're, we, we can't please everybody having an 1847 mark, uh, uh, 42, uh, but pretty cool that there was that mixture of rifle and then buck and ball you know so it, it, it leads it, it allows some pretty cool impressions um obviously if you know some guys don't have 42s and they still want to stick to that 69 caliber if guys have 1816 uh, conversions etc you know we're, we're going to allow those you know to try to get that larger caliber size uh, to be kind of universal in that company um, so, uh, some, some, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, companies armed with different rifles like that. I, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. And, uh, that's, 
Now, Andrew, if I recall correctly, these 55s, were they brought from the St. Louis Arsenal? I know you had mentioned that there was some research related to that. Uh, yeah, I don't know the specific Arsenal. The The research that I have, though, describes it's a, um, or one of the pieces that I have describes in a letter from the colonel of the regiment in 1863 and, and um, describes verbatim exactly what you just uh, uh, detailed. Great. Okay. Well, let me pop something that comes in regularly in this discussion about Ohio units. Uh, I see the OVM brass not allowed. Let's talk about that real quickly. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to pass that over to you. So. <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, my my our my understanding uh, based off of the uh, the photographic evidence. Uh, we we don't have any. Um, any early war photos that we know of that are ID'd specifically to the ninth, at least that, that we've seen in our research. Um, but the, uh, the photographic evidence that we've seen of regiments that are wearing the uniform that is similar to what the ninth, that, that we know that the ninth was issued show that they were wearing U S buckles, every single one of them, as far as, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I think Stephen, uh, in our discussions, we uh, both came to that that conclusion. Good. Well, so there's that one photo, obviously, that we for proprietary reasons we can't share. Um, that um, it's you know there, there's this one uh, Ohio guy that's un unfortunately unidentified, but his uniform matches down to you know everything down to the firearm that the. Uh, that the ninth Ohio had, you know, he's got the kepi on, he's got the frock with the shoulder by, or for the epaulets. He's got the dark trousers on and he's got a 55. Um, there, we don't, unfortunately it's unidentified, but it's thought to possibly be ninth Ohio or something that was in that same, you know, that was mustering in around that same time. And you can clearly see a U.S. belt buckle on him. So unfortunately, it's just one of those things where we don't have concrete, you know, records that state it just because they don't survive or they were never really documented in the first place um, that were, you know, kind of erring on the side of caution and just going with U.S. belts, because that's what, you know, most photos of the guys at that time are wearing. So, um, you know, we've, we've kind of had to make an executive decision on that to stick with the U.S. belt models. Fantastic. And gang out there watching right now, this is a chance. If you've got questions, I see 22 of you up right now. Uh, blast in some blast in questions if you have them. If not, we're going to keep going and not take your, too much of your Sunday evening. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, let's move on to the Haversack and Canteen. Stephen, I think we'll let you start this one off because we're getting near the end of major pieces here. So the canteen was uh, a fascinating find. Whenever I saw this, I was like, oh, crap, what are we going to do about this? Um, you know, just it's something in the hobby that that you really just do not see these India rubber canteens. Um, and um, oh, I'm just going to point out a good thing that he says he doesn't recall any opium belt, belt pumps being dug at Carnifex Ferry. Um, so, you know, that's a high likelihood that, you know, or, you know, leads to some of that evidence and maybe they weren't there. So thanks for that, Eric. Great. Thanks, um, Eric. So getting into the canteen, um, we there's a guy by the name of Frederick Finnup that served in the Ninth Ohio. And um, he wrote about their kind of their step off whenever they were moving into Western Virginia at the time. And he talks about how they're getting to the station, you know, to take a train away. Um, it talks about goodbyes, crying, you know, thinking about the peace that they had before they were going off to this you know, great new adventure for them. And then it talks about how, then again, others were studying the surrounding country. Others were taking memorandums. Others were taking notes to send to the papers, which is, you know, these two guys, uh, Friedrich Birch and Wilhelm Stengel did a lot. Um, and then it says others were drunk and singing war songs, which, you know, over the next 14 months, you'll see is a common theme among the Ninth Ohio. Um, and occasionally took another drink out of their India rubber canteens. And then he specifically says, then we had rubber canteens at the start. I, for myself, had drank some whiskey and don't know, rec don't now recollect whether I had any in my canteen or not. Um, so he talks about, you know, that those canteens were used for pretty much everything. It seems, you know, kind of going into that German, uh, that, that, uh, the German con you know, 
common topic about alcohol, which we'll get into later on as we're, as we're releasing information about this. Um, so whenever we were looking into a little bit of the rubber canteens, um, I, I don't recall, I think it was the 10th U.S. regulars that uh, did like a trial run of them out west at some point. I saw Alexander Stowe. Um, kind of mentioned that he had one made up for this as you know for that impression out west um but in uh there's a, a goodyear catalog that uh that shows kind of what goodyear was saying as rubber canteens and it matches exactly with what you actually had will in that uh that india rubber episode that the digest did well um, and, and so here's you say, and here's where we get nearby, right across the line from Ohio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Collector Mike Washner has one, and I was blessed to go to Pittsburgh with Jeremy Bavard and his wife, Felicia Conrad Bavard, and got to know Mike as a wonderful gentleman and see this thing, and it's in the Digest episode that Stephen linked up in the group, so you'll be able to see that over in the event page. And so what we've done um, is we are actually working on a bully by run of these canteens. Um, so if you're looking to attend Dean Oiner, pick one up if you can. Um, obviously uh, we know that there was a quote um, later on. Um, I think it was in August uh, that a member of the ninth Ohio document that only about 60 man per or 60 men per company still had theirs. Um, so obviously there, there was some likelihood, you know, that they were kind of thrown away or they fell apart, you know, something like that. Um, so if guys want to bring their, you know, their regular 58 smooth side, that's good. Um, if guys want to take the extra step and they want to get rubber canteens, I know I'm getting one. I'm kind of excited for it. Uh, we are having a run done of these. Um, they, so we do have a bully buy that we are doing on the rubber canteens. Um, we're looking at $115 a piece and they can be picked up at the event. Um, again, now guys, I just want to stress that it's not required for you to have one of these canteens. If you want one, get one. If you want to stick to your regular 10 drum canteen, that's fine as well. Or for your smooth side canteen, that's, that's fine as well. Um, but you know, this, this is one of those items that's going to be kind of that difference maker on an impression. Uh, that I would recommend getting one, but obviously not requiring because, uh, you know, we did receive those reports that they had fallen apart. Um, and if guys have any other questions about those canteens, please let me know. But like I said, about 60 men per company in late August were reported still having. Yep. Uh, and getting into the haversacks. So a lot of the haversacks that were being issued to the guys at Camp Denison uh, were actually like an India rubber ca uh, pattern ha or India rubber canteen or uh, sorry india rubber haversack um and they appear in just numerous photos of early 1861 ohio guys being formed actually at the very beginning of this episode um there's a soldier uh or there's a picture of two soldiers sitting together uh they're in you know heavy marching order with their uh knapsacks big overall blankets up on top and if you look at their haversacks they've got those rubber haversacks on and so one of the interesting things that they actually have, if you take a look at their haversack stripe, and this is seen in a multitude of uh, photos um, of uh, early Ohio units, is they actually have like a white or natural strap with a couple uh, colored stripes running through them. Um, we are still working out the particulars of this, uh, but we will also be offering a bully buy for these uh, for these early Ohio uh, rubber naps or sorry, rubber haversacks. Yep. And um, Stephen, I'm going to break in for just a second. Guys, I've gone to the cover slate for just a second here. Sorry, I don't have a graphic ready with just those two fellows, but it's the two fellows on the right of your frame as you're seeing. And if you look through the text that I put up there, especially the guy who's to our left, you can see the shiny haversack and you can see the uh, very light non rubberized uh, sling that's hold or strap that's holding it. There's a really good look at it right there. So. That's a look at that, and we'll have it up elsewhere as well, and we're back. Sorry, Stephen, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, well, that guy on the left that you also see, I believe that that gentleman is uh, documented to be with the 7th Ohio under Erastus B. Tyler, um, which, you know, very important to the Carnifex Ferry story. The 7th Ohio was actually attacked on um, August 26, 1861 at Kessler's Cross Lanes about two miles from Carnifex Ferry. Um, and these guys were, were mustering in a Camp Denison right around the same time as the 9th Ohio, and they were receiving virtually the exact same uniform, as you can see from that picture. Great. Um, and that guy, it's not as clear as the one that was on the right with the two gentlemen, but he's also got that rubber haversack with the uh, with the with like the white stri or strap. Great. Um, we are, 
like I said, we're still working on the particulars of the bully buy, but once we get those, we'll be posting those out as well. Good. Well, let me turn to three questions in the chat here for you fellas. Erica Banis, good evening, said this might have been mentioned earlier. It hasn't. Uh, what is the ex what is ex exactly the Ohio pattern knapsack, and how is it different from the federal double bag knapsack? Either of you can either of you handle that, or do we just know it's Ohio knapsack based out of uh, research we've done? So, <laughs> I'm about to say, hey, Eric Smallwood, post some pictures of yours since you have one. Uh, but so they're similar in a way, but I mean, it's kind of the construction is a little bit different. Um, unfortunately, I'm definitely not a knapsack expert. Um, so getting into the particulars, I really can't, you know, I can't say too much. I will say that we are working on a run of the Ohio pattern knapsacks, um, and I will be sure that once we are completed to post some photos of those Ohio pattern knapsacks, um, so you can see those differences. Um, I just, I just don't know the terminology or you know whatever I would say to try to to describe them accurately. But Eric, I will get back to you about that. So, okay. and let's not say things inaccurately, other than to say we will get better information for you. Yep. Justin May says Ohio militia blankets that were given to early troops had OVM stitched in the gray blankets. Uh, do we know that those that that's the case here, or is that just generally the case across Ohio troops? Gen generally, the case across Ohio troops is, you know, among the early Ohio troops. Um, but something to keep in mind about the 9th of Ohio is the blankets that they received were pretty terrible. Um, you know, all the mentions of them talk about how thin they were, that they were basically ratty and torn into July of 61. Uh, so we, we don't have any records of them getting reissued new stuff by Carnifex Ferry. Uh, but the blankets that they received were, you know, just in pretty poor condition. Uh, but, I mean, that is a case about the OVM, but, you know, again, related to exactly what they had, um, you know, in rough shape is what they were. <laughs> okay. Let me ask this, and I think this is just sort of a conjecture here. Uh, Bradley Finfrock asks, would the 58 smooth side canteens have a Cincinnati cloth strap? I think we're at a point where it's a, if you don't go ahead and make a part of the bully buy, or if you want to support that with your own, you're bringing your 58 because it's the right era. We don't know they were issued 58 smooth sides, do we? It's just uh, this is the acceptable if you don't go the level of purchasing a $115 thing. Is that appropriate um, to say? Essentially, yes. Um, and uh, I'm going to kind of read one thing and I'll, I'll get back but eric just posted that the uh the knapsacks were offered through the uh i'm probably going to butcher this the pronunciation but scholler hartley and graham you win the catalog uh you win. <laughs> uh and uh they were purchased for the first and second ovm on their way to manassas um and then a sample pack was sent to columbus and produced for both ohio and indiana indiana troops uh, until at least mid 62 um, there are photos of guys having them as early as Philippi um, in 60, you know, June of 61 and then as late as Vicksburg. So, you know, they, they're seen pretty, pretty widespread, actually. Uh, and they're they're a cool pack. Um, my dates may be wrong, but I don't think by this point that the Cincinnati Depot was actually established. Um, getting into the actual, you know, whether or not it was a Cincinnati Depot canteen uh, or the cloth strap. Um Somebody can probably check that, but I don't think the Cincinnati Depot was actually established at this point yet. So um, probably, you know, we could, you know, cloth straps, obviously, you know, yeah, use them, uh, maybe some uh, leather straps as well. Um, but uh, just something to take into consideration. I'll look into that a little bit more to try to get an exact answer and you know, make a post on the page as well. So great. Uh, let me ask one more thing. Tentage. So these guys had tents. Um, the issue with the tents, um, is that they were actually, these guys were moving from Birch River, Weston area, um, of West Virginia. And it's some pretty rough terrain coming down through there. If you've never been to that area of West Virginia, um, and there's, uh, there's quotes, um, and letters that we have looked at that whenever they stepped off, um, from Weston, those tents were actually thrown into a wagon and, uh, they did not catch back up to the men um, until the day after the battle. 
Um, and all the letters we've received report these guys were sleeping on arms. Uh, you know, they would have had their accoutrements still on them, sleeping on the rifle, similar to what we did at Picket Post out land between the lakes a few years ago. Um, that's what these guys were doing because the, the Confederate Army was three, four hundred yards away. Obviously, you're not dressing down. You're not, you know, you're not kind of relaxing at that point because the, the enemy is so close. Um, so, you know, just uh, because they were in the wagon, we're, we're going without tents. Uh, they didn't have the shelter house at this point. Um, so, you know, guys, no tents for this one. OK. Or if you bring a common tent, we'll collect it and give it to back to you the day after the battle, which means right when you're ready to leave and go home, we'll hand it to you. We can take That's care simply, of it for yeah. you. So, <laughs> Um, fellas, is there anything else on the highlights? Uh, we're close to a half an hour and I don't want to take people out. I know some folks have stayed with us the whole time and really appreciate, appreciate the interactions guys, uh, from my history fellas here, anything we want to throw out yet? I'm going to bring up one thing, uh, which, uh, is kind of close to some people's hearts whenever it comes to going out in the field and that's going to be ground cloths. Um, if you look at our guidelines, the preferred ground cloth is none, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, but it talks about um, that, you know, on May 4th. So this is pre this is, um, you know, this is pre three year. This is whenever the regiment is a three month regiment just mustering in. We have documentation that they received five India rubber blankets <laughs> for the entire regiment. And um Frederick Fennup, who we had discussed earlier, writes later on that uh, he's got a pretty pretty good quote about picket duty, which, you know, if you went to picket post at Lane Between the Legs, you kind of understand his uh, understand some of his uh, uh, distress on this or uncomfortable um, and says, I got on picket. It commenced raining in the afternoon and now to go on picket with my wet clothing was a sour pill. We had no rubber blankets then yet. We only had one woolen blanket apiece. Um, and these would keep a man dry for some time, but at last would leave water through. Um, so, again, these guys did not have rubber blankets. They were issued one wool blanket, and that's it. Um, so we're, you know, kind of the preferred is none. Guys, leave them at home. Um, obviously, make a judgment call whenever it comes to potential weather situations. If anybody attended Floyd's Folly, you know that it rained from once we got there until we got home. Guys still had a great time, but it was wet. Um, and uh, but yeah, so uh, you know, civilian rubber blankets. I'm actually working on a potential run of civilian rubber blankets for this event uh, in limited numbers. Um, or if you have to go with a tar ground ball, just try to avoid the regular U.S. issue rubber blankets. Uh, they, they wouldn't have had them at this point. All right. Uh, Guy Calvi chirps in, did I miss about the Kepis? Uh, Guy, that is up in there, and definitely we know that's the other option for the main, for the main preferred is either a hardy hat or a uh, Kepi. So uh, somebody want to go deeper into what those options are and why, Andrew, maybe you want to hit touch on that real quick, why those options are where they are? Uh, well, my understanding is uh, the decision was made based on the, uh, the, the Havelock. Um, the, the, the popularity of the Havelock is uh, kind of an indicator that uh, these guys would have... Uh, uh, worn that, but Stephen, you said something earlier uh, yesterday about um, the the cappy versus the hat, the um, the forage cap. Well, um, so uh, again, I, I've I've talked to Eric Smallwood quite a bit about this recently to get a better understanding of what the um, Ohio regulations actually call for, um, and you know we're kind of we're kind of touching on a couple things because they were issued two uniforms. Um, a lot of it is kind of you know individual soldiers. Uh, what, the, what they would prefer. And uh, to go back to what we had talked about earlier, the, um, the, the um, dress uniform for Ohio at that point called for a cap, um, called for blue trousers, uniform coats, frock coats with scales. So that's where we're getting that heavy from. The fatigue uniform called for um, uh, the, oh, what I would call like an Ohio hardy hat, essentially, with blue flannel blouses and gray satin net uh, trousers, which would be the gray trousers with the black stripes. Um, 
so they were issued both of these and they were initially issued the caps on May 27th. And I think they got the, uh, they got the hats on June 4th. So again, they were issued both about a week apart from each other. And because we do have that documentation that the Havelocks were so well liked, um, one of the guys actually writes in the Cincinnati Volkswagen basically begging in June for Havelocks and talks about getting into like that German pride of the, the people in Cincinnati says, will you send your the ninth Ohio, ninth and pure German regiment, so-called Havelocks, you know, because of the sun that's beat down on them. Um, so just based off of, you know, we know that they were wearing them because of the popularity of the Havelocks. Um, you know, that that's, you know, and, is, and being part of that um, Ohio regulation. Again, these are state regs, not federal regulations at this point. Um, that That's what we're going with the Kepis. So, um it's it's going to be interesting because, you know, usually you go to events and you see forge caps as being kind of for, forges or hardies being the preferred. And we're kind of switching it up a little bit with these German guys going with some cappies. So um, and, and an 1861 just to, story. Yep. Just to add in there, um, we still have the um, hold on the uh, the civilian hats in there, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah. So um, the reason we uh, we left that in there is there is a story a little bit later in the book of German Hurrah um, that uh, talks about uh, the Ninth Ohio, um, we'll say, acquiring uh, some civilian hats from an empty store in West Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. And it describes uh, even elegant women's and men's hats, uh, all kinds of articles of clothing and fashion articles. Uh, medicine, fuels, etc. Um, and so what they say is uh, that it previously was looted. Um, and so uh, this comes from the Volksfreund on October 20th. Um, so it, it, it is a while after, but we don't know how long um, before October 20th that was looted. And so um, w we said uh, acceptable, but uh, sort of... Uh, uh, and discouraged, right, discouraged uh, black civilian hats. Great. Uh, Kevin Barnes asks, will we be sleeping on arms at the event? Kevin, the original fellas did for an evening. I would be ready for it if I were you. And Elsie Gam says, prost, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so. It must not kind be a peak. <laughs> Uh, All right. As we get close to the end here, wrapping up, Andrew, do we have anything more from you? The uh, no. The only thing that I would like to uh, to add is, uh, like Stephen said at the beginning, um, I had uh, uh, several people helping me um, with uh, with this research project. So I just want to give uh, some quick shout outs. Um, Joe Lichty was a big uh, a big help. Uh, John Sarver uh, spoke with me at length on the phone um, about some of these early Ohio things. Um, Royal Magnell uh, was really helpful on the arms. Um, Dietmar Schmidt over in Germany uh, was very helpful on some of the uh, weird translation questions that I had. Um, and then uh, Dan Woolert uh, and Joseph Reinhardt are both uh, um, have published works on, uh, on the subject and were also uh, very helpful. So thank you. True becoming, uh, truly becoming a real team effort. It's a lot of fun to see that. Uh, Stephen, anything in your world? Uh, no, guys. Um, just uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this. Um, trying to switch things up, do some more live streams so we can. Uh, there's it's a very unique impression with again a lot of micro history that we're kind of jumping into on this. Uh, you know the um, kind of the the uniform guidelines are going to be a small part of the overall impression that we're putting on here. Um, we're really trying to dive into what it meant to be a German American soldier during the Civil War in 1861. Um, so we got a lot of cool stuff in the works coming down the coming down the pipe for this. Um, and the only thing I would make is just to announce that I think it is next Sunday we will be announcing company commanders for the event. Um, that will be just be posted on the Dean Oiner page, so we can uh, so get ready for next Sunday. That will be our kind of our next big announcement. Great. Uh, one last question. Elsie Gam said, would the bully by Havelocks be fitter for forage caps or kepis? Uh, we will have to get back with you on that one, Elsie. The, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the, the piece that you shared with me, Stephen, uh, it said it had a, uh, an adjustable, um, tie to it so it could fit, uh, um, 
you know, different different style hats or whatever. So we'll have an answer. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, and and uh, we can discuss that more. But uh, we we kind of have some actual um, an explanation that appeared in a, an Ohio newspaper about these havelocks that kind of talks about how they were made. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there's so much cool documentation that we've come across in this, um, that, uh, we're going to, we're going to be putting to use here, uh, to kind of give that unique experience. Good. Well, Hey gang, if there's questions, send a message to the two bore historic events page or post it on the denoiner page. We'll bounce it up to whoever's appropriate and work hard to get you the answer as soon as we can. Um, and we got Wiel and Dank from LC on the answer there. So those of you trying to keep your German going, that's roughly translated. Many thanks. And I think that's what we'll say to all of you for spending time with us this evening. Many thanks. Uh, Andrew, thanks for doing this. Steven, thanks for doing this. Uh, for two more historic events, I'm Will, sort of the master of ceremonies and the keeper of technologies. And I'm going to sign us off for the evening and wish you guys great and we'll see you in the field hopefully very soon. Take care.